Hello, everyone. Let's see, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, let's see. Um, great. Let's see. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Well, we're just going to get started just in a minute or two, give people an opportunity to join. Um, welcome to those who have joined us. Nice to see so many familiar names. Welcome. From all all uh, parts of the world. Wonderful. Welcome everyone, welcome to those who have just joined. We're gonna give people just a couple more minutes to get signed in and then we'll go ahead and get started. Just a couple more minutes. We are just having some technical issues here but we hope that, that all goes well. Anyway, we're changing yeah. laptop and stuff, so hoping that everything will be good. Great, thank you for letting us know, Garmalia. We are uh, we are prepared <laughs> for technical issues, so um, hopefully that will not. Uh, we will be able to still uh, get all the messages across to our attendees today. But hopefully that will uh, the connection will work, and you can uh, yes. join us with video. Yes. Welcome everyone who's just joined. We're going to give just one more minute to let uh, others join us, give an opportunity for people to sign in. It's wonderful to see so many familiar names. And from so many parts of the world. I love this picture of Garmalia and John Brunel, the cap. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful one. It's a great shot. Okay, um, thank you to everyone who's just joined us. Welcome. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time. There's a, a lot to hear today, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and start the webinar. So thank you for joining us. Good morning, good evening, good night uh, from all parts of the world. Uh, so, uh, my name is Veronica Cedillos, and I have the honor to serve as president of Geohazards International, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this webinar today. Please feel free to ask questions at any time in the Q&A. Um, either myself or the speakers will answer directly there, or we will do so live at the end of the program. So, before we get started, um, it, I'm going to just give a very, very brief background on Geohazard International for those of you who may not know us. For those of you that do know us, please bear with me for the next three slides just to get some background as we get started. So Geohazard International, GHI, is a global nonprofit founded in 1991 with headquarters in California, so over 30 years ago. Um, our mission is to end preventable death and suffering from natural disasters in the world's most at-risk underserved communities. Our approach really focuses on working in advance to on proactive preventative measures. So we don't wait for a disaster to happen to start acting. Uh, we wanna be there before when we know it's most effective to save lives and protect communities. We apply the latest science and engineering and you'll be hearing a lot of this and through 
uh, a lot of the collaborations we have with scientific and engineering institutions. Um, we aim to be a catalyst for long-lasting impact. This is really important. Building disaster resilience is not a one-time thing. You really have to build it into a long-term approach. So you'll be hearing a lot about um, you know, ways that we design our programs in such a way that they have impact beyond one particular project. And we emphasize strong local engagement and presence, which is really a big emphasis of today, uh, as you will be hearing directly from our uh, local staff members on the ground. Ultimately, our goal is to stay ahead of disasters. We champion a vibrant future for all, in which people are protected and prepared ahead of natural hazard events and climate impacts. We have experience in over 20 low and middle income countries, and we currently have staff in six countries, including headquarters in the United States. The webinar today is going to really focus on our Caribbean program, but we do have a very active program in South Asia, uh, but that will not be the topic of today's webinar, uh, uh, but will something that we feature in either past webinars or in, in future webinars. Um, we started off as an earthquake focused organization and, and uh, very soon after started addressing earthquake related hazards such as landslides and tsunamis. And more recently we started uh, including climate induced hazards in our work. And a lot of the motivation behind this is that we were clearly hearing from the communities where we work that this is a dire need and something that was very concerning to, uh, to the communities where we're working. So today's uh, webinar is actually the third episode uh, from our Voices from the Field webinar series. This actually started during the pandemic. Um, in 2020, we all of a sudden we could no longer have in-person events, so we were left with having to go virtual. And one, the silver lining behind this is that it allowed us to bring the voices of our local staff members to people who were interested around the world, uh, who were interested in the work of Geohazard International. So in many ways, this has been a wonderful opportunity. Um, so in this series, we feature our local team from the communities where we work, and the intent is really to highlight their perspectives and experiences. And I think this really aligns with who we are as an organization as our approach really promotes locally led and locally informed um, ways of, of building disaster resilience. Uh, this particular webinar is quite timely. It's been 12 years since the January 2010 Haiti earthquake that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And it's been five months since the destructive magnitude 7.2 NEEP earthquake in Southern Haiti. And just these last couple of days, that same area has been experiencing moderate earthquakes that have caused damage, panic, and death. GHI has been engaged in Haiti since the 2010 earthquake, starting with a visit to the affected area about a month after the 2010 earthquake to try to learn from that event. And this was followed by multiple efforts in Northern and Southern Haiti with a focus in Northern Haiti to begin with as we were very concerned about the earthquake hazard in that area. Before I pass it on to the speakers, I wanna give just a very broad uh, context for those of you who might not be familiar with um, Haiti and the island of Hispaniola. So what you see here is the island of Hispaniola and uh, Haiti you see is on the West and we have Dominican Republic on the East. In the last 20 years or so, natural hazard events have taken more lives in Haiti per million people than any other country in the world. Over 35% of schools have been damaged and destroyed in recent events, starting with 2008 tropical cyclones and flood, the 2010 Haiti earthquake, 2016 Hurricane Matthew, and this is not even accounting for the 2021 earthquake um, that just occurred in Southern Haiti. Over 50% of the population is below the poverty line. And Haiti is expected to be one of the countries to suffer the most from climate change impacts, despite not being a big contributor. It's an isolated island nation like the Dominican Republic. And recently it's been suffering from severe political instability and unrest. So bottom line, Haiti is a very difficult place to work with deep challenges and huge needs. But I hope that what you will take away today is that there are also many opportunities. There's some great work happening on the ground and incredible people who are deeply committed to their communities and to building a safer and more resilient Haiti.
We have multiple speakers for this webinar. So you're gonna be hearing from our team on the ground. They're gonna share their personal experiences and perspectives on how disasters have affected them and the respective communities. We have Jeff De Devinman in the South, who was very close to the 2021 earthquake. And then our team in Northern Haiti, Garmalia Mentor William, Wendy Preville, John Brunel Pierre, who have all been working to build disaster resilience in their community. Similarly, you'll hear from Dalka Espinal in the Dominican Republic, who will share how these disasters have affected her country. Two of our team members in the United States, Heidi Center and Janice Rogers, who have been deeply involved in our programs in Haiti, will also be sharing context and perspectives. You'll hear about challenges, opportunities, and how the team is working towards a safer future for Haiti and the island of Hispaniola. Please do note that due to the pervasive connectivity issues that Haiti faces on a regular basis, we decided to pre-record the responses from our team on the ground. This is really in an effort to ensure that their messages and responses can get across to you. Um, they have joined the slide today, so please feel free to ask them to ask them any questions at any time. And hopefully at the end, they can um, join us live with video for the Q&A session. So with that, let's uh, start with Heidi. So Heidi Stenner is a JTI project manager and she's a geologist by training. She is based in the US in Richmond, Washington. She has 23 years of experience addressing risk as a hazard geologist and in communicating risk using community-based approaches to disaster risk reduction. She currently provides technical and management support for an ongoing youth program on disaster resilience and captation, Haiti, which you'll hear about today. Heidi's gonna be providing some background and context on past disasters and natural hazards in Haiti and the island of Hispaniola. This background will help provide context for some of our speaker responses that will follow. So Heidi, please, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Veronica. And welcome everybody. It's, um, we really appreciate you joining this webinar and I hope you enjoy it. So let me um, share my screen. So it's gonna take over from you, Veronica. And so I think everyone should hopefully be able to see it. So um, yeah, my name is Heidi Stenner and I'd like to give you the, the background um, on the 2021 earthquake um, and the, the historical context um, to kind of prep you for, for our other speakers today. So um, this is the, the island of Hispaniola as Veronica had pointed out. Um, you'll be hearing um, from three people in Cap Haitian here. Um, led by Garmalia Mentor William, Dr. Garmalia Mentor William. Uh, so you can see um, on this map, these red lines are the major active fault lines um, affecting the area. And you can see that Cap Haitian here is located near the Septentrional Fault. And this fault is capable, we think, of uh, magnitude seven earthquakes. So, um, so Cap Haitian is at risk to those um, sized earthquakes, but they're also at risk from much larger earthquakes, magnitude eights, along the North Hispaniola Fault, um, they, which is also capable of producing tsunamis. And unfortunately in 1842, there was a major magnitude eight, we think earthquake, um, probably along the North Hispaniola Fault and a tsunami that ended up killing um, approximately half the population of Cap Haitian. So moving along the Septentrional Fault, um, we get to Delca over in Santiago de los Caballeros. And um, so she'll be speaking later today. And you can see that, of course, the hazard doesn't stop at the borders, um, it follows the fault. So we still have the same um, earthquake hazard um, here in Dominican Republic. And down here in Southern Haiti, um, Jeff Day, who will be speaking next um, here in Ansevo, um, was located very close to the epicenter of the 2021 earthquake, um, which is associated with this Enriquillo Plantain Garden fault which also produced um, and is associated with the 2010 um, really disastrous um, earthquake in Haiti. So this is a map from the USGS modeling the shaking that um, occurred during that earthquake in 2021. So the warmer colors here, you can see a fairly large area here of the Tiburon Peninsula that experienced you know, strong to violent shaking. Uh, and the rest of uh, Hispaniola, they were um, experiencing, for example, our staff um, in Cap Haitian and Delca and Santiago, um, they were experiencing more weak to light shaking. So the, the damage is, of course, very, very much focused in, in this area of Haiti. And you can uh, see these, um, these Roman numerals are indicating 
um, not just modeled shaking, but what people actually reported in USGS's Did You Feel It system um, on the ground. So in Ansebo, where Jeff Day lives, uh, they were experiencing very strong to severe shaking, um, but it got up to violence um, in some places here. So now we're zooming into that same map. You can see the extent of the strong shaking. Um, and you may have heard after this earthquake in the news, a lot of people um, discussing Kai and Jeremy. Um, and that's um, what made the news mostly because those are the largest cities in this area. Uh, so obviously, you know, the news goes to where the more people are and relief also is focused on places where there are the most people that are in the most need. Um, but there are, of course, many cities and many people um, in this um, throughout this area that also needed relief and support. Um, and I also wanted to mention that in the coming talks, you'll be hearing um, this is sort of some geography um, of Haiti. So um, this is the Tiburon Peninsula you're seeing here. And uh, these are the departments or maybe provinces um, in other places. So um, this is the NEEP department, which Ansevo is located in. And you'll also be hearing about the Sud department and Grand Anse. Um, so Jeremy's in Grand Anse and Kai is in Sud. So uh, the earthquake triggered um, probably about 5,000 landslides. So the USGS um, had a team map landslides uh, using satellite imagery uh, shortly after the earthquake. And you can see just the widespread and the distribution of landslides that they were able to identify. And you can see all these different colors. So the white ones um, are, are your, your average landslides, I guess you could say, the, uh, the red triangle uh, landslides, those are ones that the team had flagged because these landslides appeared to potentially threaten people or structures. So those were flagged. And then you can see in purple, these are landslides that blocked roads or other access. And that of course is a, a big deal when it comes to providing relief and supplies. So this is a main highway between Jeremy and Kai. And this area was blocked by a large stretch of landslides that caused severe disruption in getting relief and just moving people around to understand what has happened um, after the, immediately after the earthquake. So this is an image on the left um, from the USGS's report uh, showing the extent of this, this stretch of highway that just was badly impacted by landslides. And this is a picture from the ground from the government um, of people trying to clear. So you can just see how long it would take to try to clear this amount of material on this stretch of road. So it took days. And on this map again, looking at the little yellow circles, these are all the landslides that ended up blocking rivers or drainages. So here on the left, we see a picture of one of those from the USGS report. And these um, landslides, when they block a river channel or a drainage, they have the potential to pond water behind them, um, which can flood upstream. Um, and also if this landslide dam material um, builds up and then suddenly releases as the water erodes through it, you can get really catastrophic flooding um, downstream. So these are something to really keep an eye on. Unfortunately, there were no catastrophic issues with this, um, but there was this uh, tropical depression grace that came over the area two days after the earthquake. So some of these landslides may have occurred from tropical depression grace. grace. Um, with the satellite imagery, you know, it's hard to tell which, um, which what the source was for the landslide. Um, but uh, fortunately, it wasn't a stronger hurricane because that would have uh, implied even more rain and could have potentially caused even worse damage and, um, and issues. So what was the impact? What were the impacts on people in Haiti uh, from this uh, 2021 earthquake? So there were 2,200 people killed, over 2,200 people killed. There were 13,000 approximately injured. And there are hundreds of thousands of homes damaged or destroyed. And of course, after a big earthquake, when your homes are destroyed, um, and then there's aftershocks threatening further damage, um, you have to live outside. And so there were many, many people living outside exposed to the elements, you know, in makeshift tents and shelters. Um, and so that is um, a really big impact to people, especially when then um, the tropical depression grace comes by and, and drops more rain and winds. Oh, sorry about my dog. 
so then, then uh, we had, um, oh, and I wanted to mention, Veronica uh, mentioned it briefly that just this week, there were two other uh, magnitude um, six, excuse me, magnitude six earthquakes. No, excuse me. There were two other magnitude five earthquakes um, that happened just this week that caused at least two deaths and many more injuries and damaged buildings further. So um, this is five months after the earthquake, the main shock. So we are still seeing people outside exposed to the elements because um, you don't want an aftershock to, to cause even more damage and bring, bring the house down around you. So um, it's an ongoing issue. So in the 2021 earthquake, we had approximately 39,000 people displaced with 650,000 people estimated to need assistance. Um, and more than 800,000 people were affected. So uh, the 2010 earthquake, I'm sure you'll, you'll remember um, that one. Um, this is the location of the 2010 earthquake. This is a nice graphic by Tembler. And uh, this um, 2010 earthquake, you can see in gray, the mini aftershocks that moved, uh, that uh, ruptured along the fault to the west afterwards. Um, and this yellow circle here is the 2021 earthquake. And you can see the, the first few days of aftershocks also followed a similar pattern um, breaking along the fault to the west. So uh, there's kind of this little gap here you, you see. Um, and, and over here, this part of the fault and on the far west side of the fault, these are areas that we don't think have ruptured recently. Um, and so they could be the next ones to um, have earthquakes. So there is a long history of earthquakes, uh, strong earthquakes in this part of Haiti. And uh, Jeff Fay will be talking more about this too, uh, but I just wanted to give you some sort of geographic context. So um, here on this map, um, again, this is the Tiburon Peninsula, Port-au-Prince, and the capital is over here. So here's our 2021 earthquake. And um, it was associated with the Enriqueo Garden Plantain Garden Fault. Um, but in 1770, uh, there was also a very large earthquake, we think perhaps a 7.5. Of course, in 1770, we didn't have the great records we do today, um, so that's an estimation. And similarly, in 1860, there was another strong earthquake which produced a local tsunami, and it is possible that that may have helped um, fill in the gap of, of part of the fault that needs to rupture um, back from 1860, but we don't know. Um, it's, it's very unclear. Uh, in 1952, there was a magnitude six earthquake. Um, and so um, three months after the magnitude six, there was a very similar size, slightly smaller aftershock in 1953. Uh, so 2010 over here, it affected uh, Port-au-Prince. And that of course, with the several million people here, that is why the, uh, the earthquake was so much more, um, fatal, there were so many more people exposed. So in 2010, this is a very urban setting, whereas in 2021, um, the, the population is uh, much more um, spread out and, uh, and more rural, um, and it's, it's a much less urban setting. So that is why the, the, the fatality and injury numbers were, were lower in this earthquake. So um, again, in 2015 here, we've got a swarm of smaller earthquakes that caused a lot of of fear and unsettlement of people. Um, and then we had the 2021 earthquake. So now it's the big question mark is what's the future to bring. So uh, tropical depression grace I mentioned may have uh, caused additional landslides, not clear right now, um, but, and it occurred, this is the track here on this map of where it tracked over Haiti two days after the earthquake. And it brought, you know, five to 10 inches of rain up to 15 inches of rain um, in isolated locations and, and greater winds. So, you know, when you're living outside in makeshift shelters, it is really insult to injury. So this is my last slide, and this is a crazy map. Um, this shows the um, hurricanes and tropical storms and depressions uh, that tracked over the area um, in the last, you know, 150, 150 years-ish. And, um, so I wanted to mention that this is tropical storm, tropical depression grace that tracked over two days after the earthquake. But um, Jeff Day will also be mentioning Hurricane Flora and, and Veronica did also. Uh, this is a, a category four hurricane in 1963 that caused 
really devastating flooding um, and a lot of, of damaged buildings um, and, and infrastructure and, and killed people. Uh, Hurricane Matthew in 2016 um, was also a category four. And um, you know, this is this is just to show this area is at high risk from hurricanes as well as earthquakes. And um, to help address um, people's hazard, we really have to look at multiple multiple hazards and risks, and we can't just focus on one. And especially given climate change, as as, um, as Veronica mentioned, you know, climate change is going to change things a bit. And as hurricanes are forecasted to get stronger, uh, that means that more rain and more winds and storm surge and everything, you know, will just add to the the, the hazards that people face here. So. Um, moving forward, we also need to consider the fact that earthquakes and strong hurricanes can um, occur close in time. You know, we like to think, oh, well, that's so unlikely. But, you know, a couple of years ago, would we have thought that having a magnitude 7.2 um, here um, would be coinciding with the global pandemic and then a tropical depression cross over two days later? I, mean, I think we would have thought that was kind of a long shot. So um, you never know, we, we need to um, really help people um, and infrastructure be more um, resilient to, to what the future will hold. And, and that's what GHI um, hopes to do. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over uh, to Veronica. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heidi, that was excellent. Um, one second while I reshare my screen. Hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Um, give me one second here. Let me just, uh, okay. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to uh, Jeff de Devilme. Uh, he's a GHI field officer who's native to and based in Haiti's Southern Peninsula and on Savo, as you've heard. Um, and he's been working with GHI since 2016. He has experience working in various fields, including disaster risk reduction, law, education, safe water, and public health to strengthen rural populations at risk. He was only about 10 miles from the epicenter from, of the August 2021 earthquakes and has been leading a lot of our pre and post earthquake activities in the region. And you're going to hear about this more from him. Um, as I mentioned before, we have we we uh, run into technical issues and connectivity issues all the time. And so in an effort to make sure his message gets across, we have pre-recorded his response. But I think we have him live, too. So he's on. It's wonderful to see him live in the, on, on camera. So feel free to ask any questions in the chat as we, we go through his responses. So first is just getting a, a, a the first question is what has been your experience with past disasters in your area? Thank you, Veronica, for this invitation. So I'm really happy to be part of this webinar as a speaker. Uh, I live in Ansavo, a small city in the southern part of Haiti, uh, mostly in NIP department. Uh, the city of Ansavo often struck by natural disasters, such as earthquakes and hurricanes. For example, in, in 1860, in 1952, and 2010, 2021 so the city struck by earthquakes regarding the weekend we will my weekend flora in 1963 and you weekend Matthew in 2016 without forgetting a swarm of small shakes in 2015 which caused panic among the population. Uh, my personal experience with you can Matthew that I, I, I heard the Directorate of Civil Protection and Assessment. So I could observe that many houses have been severely damaged or destroyed by this hurricane and the uh, southern peninsula, um, near third colors. Some of them were rebuilt or repaired by the Haitian government and some NGOs. And for example, J. Chai helped an, uh, an elderly a woman to rebuild her house uh, destroyed after the Hurricane Matthew. After the 
2010 earthquake I personally have started to know a little bit about uh, earthquake and 2016 with JHI my capacities have been improved and I have acquired some of experience which allow me to help my community during this most recent earthquake so uh, many buildings have been collapsed and and solar and peninsula. So the next question for Jesse is what disaster resilient efforts have you been leading in your community prior to the August 2021 earthquake? Uh, NJHI, we, we work before disasters to work. And NIP, my department, we usually work with school children, with uh, churches. Uh, for example, two weeks before the August 2021 earthquake, we, we conduct a big awareness campaign to win from the population what to do before, during, and after an earthquake and tsunami. In order to reach a lot of people, we use uh, several communication channels, such as door-to-door, radio show, sensitization in schools and churches. We train believers, uh, teachers. We also use sound chalk to disclose message. So sound chalk is a car with sound where we uh, we discuss probably we code messages already elaborated by JHI and validated by Directorate of Civil Protection to the population. Before our programs, our activities, most of the population didn't really know what an earthquake is and what to do to save their lives with the awareness campaign. A lot of people know what to do before, during, and after an earthquake. So that was really helped during the August 2021 earthquake. Because there was not a lot of injuries and death and unsavory. And after the earthquake, two teachers called me after uh, to thank JHI for the training because they say that help them to save their life. And the last question we have for Jesse is, what disaster resilient efforts have you been leading in your community after the August 2021 earthquake? And after the earthquake, we have been leading many activities. Uh, we can resume them and three main activities, the data collection, how to reach and eight most affected cities and NIP, and distribution of tabs to 120 families and NIP. So the data collection, after the earthquake, we develop a cash for work approach and, and collection data regarding buildings damage and benchmark building. We, we did it with uh, USAID phone and JHI dollars. We developed a collaboration with the uh, University of Notre Dame to do this. So we, we are uh, 50 local resi residents, no engineer, to conduct this. So, uh, and they receive a cash that was helpful for them when we know the local economy has been severely affected and people uh, was in a big need. And during this activity, we, we, uh, we recorded, we assessed uh, 12,687 buildings damaged and potentially damaged and uh, per, uh, 2,163 benchmark building. Uh, the, and NIP, Sud, Grados, and three departments, we 
we, we did it uh, in collaboration with uh, University of Notre Dame. So I think the disability uh, is a big, is a, has a great importance because we, we share this information and to other NGO and Tevin and reconstruction. And to do this, so local residents use the smartphone to take photos and geolocate it, uh, the, the building. We got an outreach. People, uh, after the earthquake, people were very panicked because they, there were many, many aftershocks. So uh, we, we use uh, believers, teachers, uh, committee members already trained by JHI to inform the population about what to do uh, during the aftershock and eight most cities uh, and NIP. Uh, so uh, we, we are uh, in these activities uh, 41 people. So it was also a catch for a approach. Also, the, we, we distribute tips to families in Ansavo. So we, we, usually, we often participate in the meeting with, uh, uh, with uh, authorities and with authorities and the, call and the emergency uh, center. So we, uh, we know uh, the need, the, one of the main needs uh, after the earthquake was TAPS. So we support 120 families and, and answer and provide them TAPS. Uh, we did it uh, with JHI uh, donor support. As well, uh, we, we support the uh, uh, Directorate of Civil Protection, Office and NIP and providing a uh, small cash to allow them to help the people, uh, to give people uh, weather. So I think that uh, there's activities we have, uh, we have done. Thank you, Justin, for that. Um, and I just wanted to stress that this was actually the first time in GHI's history that we've had a local staff member living in an area that was affected by a significant earthquake. So this made Jeff particularly well placed to help and support his community, especially because he had already built relationships of trust before the earthquake, as you heard from him, and he was well informed of needs um, and gaps in ways that we could provide value. Um, I also wanna say thank you uh, to many of you on the call today. A, a lot of the activities that you just heard about were made possible thanks to generous contributions from individuals, foundations, funding agencies, corporations, technical partners, and many who are on the webinar, and, and uh, m many who are on the webinar today. So thank you so much uh, from all of us, your contributions to help us address these needs on the ground that Jeff had just told us about. Um, with that, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Janice Rogers. So Dr. Janice Rogers is GHI's Chief Operating Officer. She oversees all of our international programs and has been managing international projects for GHI since 2005. She's an earthquake engineer with expertise not only in the behavior of buildings during earthquakes, but also technology transfer, capacity building, and programs to help make communities safer from multiple hazards. And Janice played a key role in opening up our Haiti and Dominican Republic program, and Janice is based in GHI's headquarters in California. So let's go to her, the first question for Janice. So Janice, can you tell us why GHI started working in Ansible in 2016 and how did the pre-earthquake efforts help in the 2020, 2021 earthquake aftermath? All right, thanks Veronica. Um, so just to provide a little bit of history going back a few years before 2016, after lots of discussions amongst ourselves in the office, well, we decided that we wanted to do a study to help figure out well, what would you rationally decide to tell people to do during shaking? So with USAID support, we prepared some guidance on uh, developing messages on protective actions during shaking. And then we applied it in Ansavo, Haiti, again, with support from USAID. 
So to build on what Jeff they shared, there was an earthquake swarm in Ansevo in 2015, and that was causing a lot of concern amongst the local population. And the government civil protection department asked us to go and work in Ansevo. So that's how we got to Ansevo. And so once we were there, there was this whole process with the local community and experts at the national level to figure out what messages to give and to prepare those messages in Creole. Um, and then the messaging was approved by the government committee that is responsible for reviewing education and awareness materials. So the awareness work that we were doing before the earthquake, which Jeff they described, was using those messages. And the messages were also ready to go when the earthquake struck. So we could talk about what to do in aftershocks, which as Jeff they mentioned, was really a key concern of people. So we collaborated with the USGS on some messages about aftershocks. They did the aftershock part and we did the what to do part. Um, uh, and then we shared them as, as Jeff, they mentioned. So it was really important to have done that work beforehand. I wanna emphasize that it would just be virtually impossible to do that in the aftermath of an earthquake. So it was key that we had those ready to go. Thank you very much, Janice. And let's move on to the next question for you. And that's after the 2010 earthquake, what were the successes and challenges for ensuring resilient buildings during reconstruction? And what challenges and opportunities do you anticipate for reconstruction following the 2021 earthquake? So um, this is a really interesting question. I'd like to start by saying we're in a much better situation in terms of having the technical building blocks in place for a resilient reconstruction than we were in 2010. So when the 2010 earthquake struck, there was no national building code for earthquake and hurricane resistant design of buildings. There was no national seismic hazard map. The key ministries such as education did not have policies or guidelines in place for earthquake resistant construction. Um, these are all in place now. Then uh, at the time of the 2010 earthquake, there were very few professionals working on earthquake safety. Now there are a lot more, especially engineers trained in earthquake and hur uh, hurricane resistant construction. So I'd also like to talk about schools for a minute as an example. Um, after 2010, there was a big effort by the education ministry, the MENFP is the acronym in French, along with their technical and financial partners to, um, to work on how do you get earthquake and hurricane resistant schools built, not just after um, the disaster to replace schools that were lost, but also in other areas of the country as part of ongoing programs. So they developed some sets, uh, some sets of standard plans, including um, things like cost estimates and a lot of detailed drawings. So the whole set of what you would need to build uh, an earthquake and hurricane resistant school and what uh, is showing on the screen right now are some examples of those types of buildings that were constructed. So um, over from what we could document, over 420 schools were built using either these plans or other types of earthquake uh, resistant or and hurricane resistant designs after the 2010 earthquake. And not, this was not just in the area affected by the 2010 earthquake, but also in other parts of the country, including the South. And from what we have seen from data coming out after the earthquake, these schools did very well. So these standard plan sets and all of the accompanying documentation and the policies, those are ready to go. They're ready to use. So that's one less challenge now that we have after the 2021 earthquake. But um, disasters destroyed over 1,500 schools in the time period between 2008 and 2016. So prior to the 2021 earthquake. And in this period, um, the if we add together the damaged schools and the destroyed schools, it's nearly 7,000 schools were damaged and destroyed in that series of disasters. And according to the post-disaster needs assessment for the 2021 earthquake, approximately maybe 1,200 more schools were damaged or destroyed. So if we look at those numbers, you've got over 1,500 schools destroyed and many more damaged versus 420 new schools that were built to be earthquake and hurricane resistant, you know, we're, we're falling behind, we're not keeping up. Um, so the, with the, the current mechanisms of building earthquake resistant schools really need to be scaled up, not only to replace the schools that are being lost to disasters, but also to start addressing the very vulnerable building stock in the rest of the country, uh, as, you, as evidenced by the level of destruction in schools over 
um, you know, the, the series of disasters, the building stock across Haiti is, is very vulnerable, uh, of school buildings in particular. Um, so general challenges for resilient schools include first and foremost, a lack of financial resources. It's gonna take a lot to start working through this large inventory of buildings that are very vulnerable to damage. So much more investment is needed in schools across the country. Um, not just for recovery, but uh, yeah, from this event, but, but in general, trying to get ahead of the risk. So, and for other types of construction, we see similar challenges. There was a lot of damage in this earthquake, which, you know, we would expect because um, there, there's a lot of buildings built before 2010, before people were really thinking about earthquakes. Uh, so we'd expect those to be vulnerable. And so that damage needs to be addressed uh, during the reconstruction recovery process. So I think the biggest challenge is going to be providing the financial and technical resources for resilient reconstruction and, and doing that you know, where they're needed in an equitable manner, not just in the cities where it's a little easier to work, but also in the rural areas, because as Heidi showed, uh, this earthquake really affected a large rural area. And self-recovery has been very important after recent disasters in Haiti. And if that continues to be the case in this earthquake, you know, people still need resources and support. So for example, if my house is damaged um, and I want to either you know, reinforce and repair it or maybe uh, reconstruct if it's really badly damaged, I need to know how to do that. So a key challenge is, is going to be getting uh, technical resources and financial resources out to the people who are trying to do that. But it's also an opportunity to really make the region much more resilient going forward. So thanks, Veronica. Thank you so much, Janice. That was excellent. Thank you for your perspectives and thoughts on that. Um, we're now going to move on uh, to our next speaker, and that is uh, Garmalia Mentor Williams. She is both a medical doctor and a disaster risk management specialist. She experienced firsthand the chaotic healthcare demands after Haiti's 2010 earthquake, and that motivated her to devote her skills to improve Haiti's disaster resilience at all levels of society. Her experience combines 15 years in public health and disaster risk reduction efforts in multiple contexts and countries. Dr. Mentor, uh, Mentor William is GHI Haiti representative and oversees and coordinates all of GHI's operations in Haiti. She is based in her home uh, city of Cap Haitian in the north. So uh, this is a uh, first question. Uh, Garbalia, what has been your personal experience with the 2010 and 2021 earthquakes? In the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake, I've been based in CAP, working at hospital in our patient section, taking care of victims coming from port of France. We not only provided general health care, but also psychological first aid to victims that were internally displaced. In the 2021 earthquake, I've been on my way to a training for club members that we created in the project named Kids in Action. Kids were already in the room when parents kept calling to ask about the safety of their children. We also realized that the children were very focused, very proactive during this session. We realized that they were behaving like this as they just felt shaky, the earth shake. We have also been in touch with a group that we created in Osavo, one of the department of the country that were affected by an earthquake recently. As we always mention, GHI is always there in vulnerable community right before disaster strike. We have trained this community in 2016 and they have sent testimonies about how they behave during this shaking. They were happy to learn about protective action and they share information with their community. Most of these committee members are teachers and working uh, at radios. So they have 
continuously share information with their community even after the end of the project. We realize that this community were very proactive. They do not wait for us to train other people of the community. They were in charge of all of this. They even ask for more training, more and more training all the time. So second question for Garmalia is, your home city of Cap Haitian in Northern Haiti has not experienced a large damaging earthquake since 1842. This can make it particularly challenging to get people to act. What strategies do you use to motivate the community to work together on disaster resilience? To be able to train or to bring people to work together in the Northern area, we have developed different strategies. We have conducting strategy of communication in order to know what are the best channels to send to disclose messages to the population. We have used voices of young people when it comes to teach or to make young people aware of disasters. We have also use cultural aspect. When we use cultural aspect, people become more excited, more proactive, more creative. We use participative and inclusive aspects in all of our training or our public communication. We invite disabled people. We usually have translator for sign language. We also advocate for life saving beyond any other belief that allow us to bring different denominations together. We have trained churches representative, which are not used to be close to another religion uh, when it comes to, uh, to disaster risk reduction. We have also teach and train people besides telling them right at the beginning what to do so they learn they know and they understand the risk and they decide on how to react depending on their built environment and uh, depending uh, of their building typology we have also used champion to promote our work we use pedagogists and psychologists in order to know the best learning techniques for young, for young people, in order to avoid traumatize young people by telling them about disaster. We also uh, use um, help from the community because some of them were aware of our work and they have been interested in joining, in helping, in assisting what we're doing. Great, thank you, Garmalia, for that. And I just want to point out that Gar Garmalia touched on a really important point in this this whole aspect of using the approach of working closely with organizations and groups that are trusted by the local community. So in this case, you heard a lot of working with churches and religious groups, which is um, a group that in Haiti is very well respected and there's a lot of trust with those groups. Um, and the last question for Garmalia, through your work in Haiti over the last several years, what needs and opportunities have you identified? In terms of needs and opportunities, must have been done, but there is still things left to be done. We need to build capacity of first responders as they are the one that should intervene during any disaster. We need to keep training national police and firefighters. We need to keep training local authorities. In Haiti, once a delegate is appointed to his position, he is immediately the representative of civil protection in his department. Once a mayor is appointed, 
is immediately responsible or representative of civil protection in his municipality. But they have not been trained most of the time. They have not known about disaster risk reduction. So we need to keep training them. We need to keep training young people, try to integrate disaster risk reduction into school curriculum and into university curriculum. We need more research in the universities about disaster management. We also wish for conciliation of scientific with decision maker, because usually decision makers, they have their own portfolio that do not conciliate the recommendation of the scientific. We need to keep doing continuous public awareness and science communication in a way that uh, illiterate uh, learn easily from us. We need to involve people with special needs, people with disability. We also need to invest in prevention. I think uh, besides all of these needs, there are a lot of opportunities because we have a young population. Young people are very proactive. They are very creative. We need to use this task force. People are more receptive after each earthquake. So this is time to keep training them, to keep making them aware of the risk. Young people are willing to join the club. Uh, young people send messages to our website, asking to help, asking to assist our work. Older organizations now are willing to partner with us. They are also willing to broadcast our activity. Thank you, Garmalia. Um, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, and that is uh, Wendy Preville, who is a project officer for GHI and is based also in Captation. He has experience in teaching, radio broadcasting, and community development. He is co-founder and Haiti representative of the nonprofit Le Roseau Initiative, which exists to improve the health and well-being of the children of Haiti through primary education. Wendy is one of our leaders of uh, GHI's youth program on disaster resilience in northern Haiti, which we've been touching upon throughout this webinar, and he's going to tell us more about that program. So, Wendy, can you tell us uh, about the youth program in the north? Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time and your participation to this webinar. And thank you, Veronica, for the invitation. My name is Wendy Breville. I am the project officer for GeoAzad International, and I am based in Cap Asian Haiti. I am working on the project Simon on Action, and it is a privilege for me to tell you more about this project. Simon on Action, in English, Kids in Action. Simon on Action brings together a diverse group of young students across the public and private schools, both in elementary and secondary levels to learn the science behind disasters and organize community activities. So, in the own voice and style, you share new knowledge about extreme earthquake and coastal risk and how to take action for disaster resilience. In this project, Simon and Action, we are working with 18 schools located in low coastal areas and uh, low coastal areas in Capetian and surrounding villages like Labadi, Petitans, and Blue Hills. We have about 24,000 students from those 18 schools involved in the project age 6 to 20 years old, both in elementary and secondary level. This is a multi-year project, but for the first year, 2021, we have experienced a lot of 
social political crisis in the country like unrest and others but in spite of all the social political crises we were able to do training at six schools for a total of approximately 6,000 students and range 6 to 20 years old. It is very important to engage youth in disaster preparedness and one of the most important reasons nearly half of Haiti population is under the age of 20 and young people are very vulnerable both physically and mentally from disasters. And as former U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. We believe in that. And this is exactly what we are doing in this project. We are building our youth for the future. We are building our youth for the future. We are expecting a change in the behavior, expecting changing behavior in future generations regarding disaster risk management. But besides the training that we do at schools, we also have the Youth Resilience Club that we form. And it is a club consisted of students from schools involved in this project for this year. We have about 30 kids who join the club and we expect to have more joining us this year. So what kind of activities that we do with them? We have dancing. We have uh, the slam poetry. We have theater and we also have paintings. We do all of those activities to create a learning environment for our students. So when they come, while we are training them uh, uh, on risk and disaster, so everything that they are doing, that they are learning, like dancing, paintings, uh, slam poetry, they are all focused on disaster risk management, on cautions to take before, during, and after on Earthquake. The kids are really passionate, really motivated to join the club. So the parents are also very enthusiastic. And they came, they came in large numbers. They joined us to say, please write my name down because I want to be part of the club. And it is very a good opportunity to work with those young people to train them through the project Simon on Action. Thank you, Wendy, for that excellent response. And the follow-up question is, how did the August 2021 earthquake in southern Haiti influence or affect the ongoing youth program in the north? Uh, uh, yeah, to answer the second question uh, about the recent earthquake that uh, hit the country uh, on August 14, 2021, uh, and how that impacted our, our, our program. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, when, the, when that happened, we were just about to have the Youth Resilience Club activities just a couple of hours before. So some of our young people, they were on their way to join the club. And it was the first time that for so many of them, they felt an earthquake, and especially with such a magnitude. And when they came that day, I, 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 that was the topic, just to tell about their reactions. How did they, how did they feel when, when the earthquake happened? and what kind of behavior they had and how did they, uh, how did their families also react. And kids become uh, more focused. They, uh, so because of the recent earthquake, they become more focused on the training, 
they, they want to learn more about disaster risk management and they think that they have the power to influence the community, they have the, they have the power to promote awareness and safer practices. So what they learn they, from us, they share it with their peers, with their family members, with their friends, because they think that the more they are prepared, they can protect the lives and help others protect the lives. And parents are also more motivated about, about this project. So they, they, they accompany the kids uh, whenever we have an activity because they think that uh, we are doing a good job. And I remember some parents even approached us and said that they also want to get trained because they want to learn about disaster risk management and they understand that especially in the north in Cap Asian we are exposed we don't know when it will happen but for sure because we always remind them about what happened in 1842 when we had a big earthquake and half of the population in Cap Asian were destroyed and because of the recent earthquake also, young people become more motivated to learn the notions of risks and disasters. And schools as well also pay more attention to the training and they become more involved in the project. And the other partners that we are working with also encourage us not only to continue the training but also to integrate and to train other institutions and other sectors on the notions of risk and disaster and it is in the same perspective that we recently organized training for the national now the national police and the firefighters because those institutions are partner and Geohazard International is working with them. So thank you uh, for watching and thank you. I look forward to answer any questions that you may have so that I can provide you maybe more information regarding the project Simun Onaxion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that very powerful response. Uh, it's incredibly inspiring to see so much engagement and enthusiasm with uh, young people. Um, this program was made possible by uh, Lydia and Tom Moran, who I believe are here today. So I just want to say thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Tom, for helping to make this program a reality and for the change that you're enabling in Haiti. Um, before we move on to the next uh, speaker, I want to thank those who are asking questions. Please keep them coming. We're answering them as we can and we might uh, elaborate on some of those in the live uh, Q&A session. Next, we will move on to um, our next speaker, John Brunel Pierre. He's a GHI field officer and is also based in Cap Haitian. He's a licensed Haitian civil engineer and was involved in supporting relief efforts in Port-au-Prince following the 2010 earthquake. This experience motivated him to dedicate his work to reduce the damaging impacts of natural hazards, and he works on GHI's earthquake and tsunami projects in Haiti. So the first question for Jean Brunel is, what are the uh, opportunities to promote disaster resilient construction in the North? Hi, everyone. It's an honor for me to participate in this webinar. Many thanks to Veronica for this great initiative. I am Pierre Jean Brunel, civil engineer and field officer for Geohazard International in Capetian, Haiti. Over the past 15 years, Haiti has experienced rapid urbanization and the number of citizens living in urban areas has doubled from 3 million to 6 million. Haiti is currently the third most urbanized country and the last the Latin America and the Caribbean region after Trinidad and Tobago and Mexico. 
Each year, more than 132,000 Asians migrate to cities, according to a report from World Bank in 2018. The North is one of the departments which has undergone more rapid urbanization during the past decade. In 2015, Cap Asian, the capital city, had 274,404 inhabitants, and in 2019 alone, the city already had more than 400,000. The situation has increased poverty and informal settlements in seismic areas. Now, a question arises. What are the opportunities to promote more resilient construction in the north? Training of masons and engineers. Structural assessments of critical infrastructures such as school, church, hospital, and we traffic them as needed. Building other electric safe cities while applying and complying with building regulation and land use principles that are realistic and risk and firm. Identification of safe land for low income citizens and improvement in informal settlements were feasible. Ensuring that the construction are not only ethnic safe but hurricane safe. It's really important. Thank you so much, John Brunel, for that. We did have some issues with John Brunel's video, so I'm going to add the two last points he made that unfortunately got cut off. And that was, um, and again, answering the question about what are the opportunities uh, to build to um, ensure more disaster resilient construction. And the last two points were teaching young people about building safely because they are the future agents of change and integration of earthquake safe construction techniques into faculty of sciences curriculum. So thank you, Jeff, so much for that. We're going to move on to our last speaker. And I apologize in advance because we're running a little bit behind and uh, we'll, we'll just uh, uh, hopefully everyone can stay on another 10, 15 minutes. Um, so we're going to hear now from uh, Delca Espinal. She is GHI Dominican Republic representative and is based in uh, home, her home city of Santiago de los Caballeros. It's located right on the Central Fault, the same one that crosses Cap Haitian on the other side of the island. Delca is a structural engineer specializing in seismic vulnerability assessment. She's the former executive director of an NGO that supports her municipality in developing its resilience strategy. She also managed the Santiago de los Caballeros grant of the National Office of Seismic Evaluation, Vulnerability, and Infrastructures and Buildings, which evaluated all schools and hospitals in the northern region and conducted several seismic structural uh, retrofits. So the first question for um, Delca is, how did the 2010 the recent 2021 earthquake impact the Dominican Republic? Hello, everyone. Thanks, Veronica, for your question. I believe that these two events caused different levels of impact in the Dominican Republic. In the case of the 2010 earthquake, due to the large number of deaths, damages, and the fact that for more Dominicans was the first experience with a big earthquake was something stunning and something that moved to take important decisions relate, related to our earthquake risk management plan. Uh, this slide shows the earthquake hazard in Hispaniola with major cities. When two countries share the same seismic fault system, uh, similar construction practices. You can say, well, in the future, we can have the same situation, a big earthquake. And that was something in the mind of the Dominican people and move to take decisions related to improve our building codes, regulations related to the land use planning, move to more awareness programs in different institutions, schools, public, private sector, and 
in the case of the 2021 earthquake, the situation or the impact was a little different because it was taken more like a reminder that we have to continue doing efforts to reduce the earthquake risk in the country. Thank you, Dalka. And the second question for you is, uh, did these events help raise awareness and lead to disaster risk reduction efforts in the Dominican Republic? Thanks, Veronica. Definitely, yes. The 2010 earthquake in Haiti was the window of opportunity to take important decisions uh, in the DR related to increase the awareness level and the disaster preparedness and emergency management actions in the country. After the 2010 earthquake, the number of public events related to reduce the earthquake risk uh, increased exponentially. We have a lot of workshops, lectures, programs, et cetera, around all the country. And we take also important decisions, for example, a new building code related to the analysis and design of the structure. Also, the national plan for comprehensive risk disaster management in 2011. And uh, this year, also, the national plan for earthquake uh, risk reduction. And a lot of uh, materials, educational materials, uh, to uh, increase the disaster preparedness. And these efforts last more than four years, very high, with very high increase mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, mm -hmm. events. But with the pass of the time, they decreased dramatically at the point that today we have, a, we have few ongoing problems uh, related to uh, reduced earthquake rates. A good example at this moment is the project lead by Geohazards International with funds of the USAID agency and the USGS, uh, supporting practical family preparedness in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. In Haiti, in two cities, Capeche and Anansebo, and in Dominican Republic, in four communities near to the sectional fault the main seismic fault system in the country. And the world started in Haiti in 2016 and in the Dominican Republic in the 2019. Some activities of this project are a source book with practical and uh, technical information about earthquakes in Spanish and English for the Dominican Republic and um, English, French, and Creole in the Haitian side. Activities uh, in these years, we uh, make some activities in public schools, private schools, churches, markets, public uh, institutions. And at this moment, we have uh, started to make some doors to doors uh, awareness programs due to the COVID situation. And we hope that in the next months, we can go again to make large events. But not only uh, earthquakes uh, are the hazards in the, in the island. We have a lot of hazards that impact uh, the country, every, uh, both countries every year. For example, we can see here in the chart the number of events related to the hazards, and we can see that storms and flows are the big ones in both countries. And for that reason, also we need to improve our policy, uh, our public policies related to to these events. For example, in the case of the Dominican Republic, we need to make improvement related to the hurricane wind uh, code because at this moment it's a, a weak point and we need to make more uh, resilient infrastructures. We need to take a more important uh, natural-based solutions, climate change adaptation projects 
retrofit in main uh, institutions in, in, in the island. Uh, uh, measures that can help to, to improve our capacities because that can be the big difference in, in the case that prevent losses uh, in damages in future uh, disasters. Thank you so much, Dalka, for that. And this is something that we're actively doing at GHI, and that is trying to work across the two countries to promote safer and more resilient practices in the entire island. And we're looking forward to continuing our work in that same collaborative spirit. Um, before we move on to the live Q&A, and thank you for your patience. I know we're going a bit over, but I'm hoping you're finding this enriching. Um, I do want to acknowledge all the various people, groups, organizations, funders, foundations, corporations that have been part of the efforts and the progress that you have heard about today. Thank you deeply from all of us. Your contributions have made a tremendous difference. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank our speakers and ask them to turn on their cameras and we can move into, into the Q&A session. So I am gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see everyone's uh, videos. Um, so maybe we can start uh, with um, elaborating on some of the questions. I saw some of the questions come in, and there was one around, you know, why didn't we, why didn't we hire engineers um, when we were doing the the post earthquake uh, data collection um, in southern Haiti? And I was wondering, and Janice did a really nice job of providing a a, a response, but I'm wondering if, if somebody, Jeff there, or even Janice, wanted to elaborate on that response. Dr. Janice, did you want to elaborate on that? I'd love Jeff Thay to speak if when he's able to get connected. Um, I can also just add, okay, there he is. Go ahead, Jeff Thay. Uh, thank you, Janice. I, I think you, you already uh, respond uh, to this question, but I, I, I want only to add that uh, uh, we, we had uh, the team, an HM, an engineer, so to lead the team. And as we, we the, the non-engineer only uh, took pictures, took photos and sent to the platform. And after uh, there is some uh, uh, volunteer engineers to rely on specific assessment. So uh, I think uh, Janice uh, gave uh, uh, a, a a wonderful answer regarding uh, that engineer uh, working on urban area that our effort were concentrated and and we are aware. So I think we uh, we are we are working on and and uh, any activity that probably uh, in a few in a few weeks we can start with uh, other assessment. So I think. Uh, that, that's all I can say for, for now, for this moment. Thank you both so much for that. Um, maybe we can move on to, the, I, I see that there was a question about the, uh, was there, was there any development related to tsunami hazard in the north. Uh, Garmalia also provided a response, but it seems like uh, maybe you want to elaborate live, uh, Garmalia, on some of those uh, efforts. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, uh, Tarek, for this question. Um, usually, uh, during our trainings, we tie earthquake and tsunami in order for the population to have an automatic response or, uh, or good behavior regarding uh, this, this hazard. Uh, we have seen flyers or other publications regarding this that untie them, so people tend to believe that Earthquake is one thing and tsunami is another one, and they do not make any, um, any tie relation uh, with them knowing that after evacuating, they should go to higher grounds. So uh, we tie them together. So um, that's a way to answer your question saying that anytime we 
talk about earthquake, we talk about, we cover uh, tsunami risk. And also uh, we realize that there is lack of information. Uh, information is not available all the time and everywhere for the population. So we decided instead of uh, sharing flyers during uh, big events, uh, we, we do murals. So we make kids uh, in the hidden action project, we make them pay walls. Uh, so we pet strategic and visible spot in the three district of, of Capetian uh, for people to get access to, to the information. So I, I, I would like to say that it's street messaging, like having information on the street uh, for people to see. And we, we disclose straightforward and, and key messaging, uh, like the tsunami signs and the, the behavior to have. So we should reach high grounds. And then uh, we plant them also in, in the tsunami inundation zone. So for people uh, working through the streets know that they are unsafe there in case uh, there is an earthquake. So, and also um, we, we aim to paint uh, the tsunami signs that, that we are taking out for the book from the, uh, uh, to the, because when they place the tsunami sign, it was very really important, but there was not enough uh, sensitization or awareness made around this or before this. So people are not really aware of the needs of taking care of them. So they were taken out in, in, in Capetian. So for now, we, uh, in collaboration with Semana, which is the service of navigation, the marine service that plays them, we aim to repair the tsunami size in a, in a different way uh, in downtown. So, on, on the walls. And so they, they do not clutter the streets uh, as the first one. And uh, they are more visible and they will be paid by young people. This is a way for them to appropriate themselves of this and to know that they should protect them while growing. So um, this is all that we've been doing uh, on tsunami size, on tsunami risk uh, with young people uh, in the community. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Carmelia. Um, there were also several questions uh, regarding what we teach people in Haiti to be safer. Um, I know there were some responses, but I'm wondering if anybody, any other speakers wanted to elaborate on that. Is this the question about, uh, about the CHO? Yes, the cover and hold and the, you know, kind of what, what we teach. Um, and I think you already answered some of that. I believe several people answered maybe different questions, but I'm wondering if anyone wanted to elaborate on that question. Yes, Veronica, for response to Eric and James, I believe that only drought cover and hold, and hold is not enough. For example, when I doing some training, I talk with the people and say uh, that maybe I can pass a uh, two hours or three uh, taking that before, during, and after an earthquake. What uh, you want to, uh, you need to do, and is that enough? And something that uh, I always talk to the people is that the situation is important. That how you can react, and something that I that I encourage in all my. Uh, programs and awareness outreach is that more preparation you have, more opportunities to uh, you have to uh, get out any situation, not only earthquake. For example, in the student in the schools, the students really like this that I told that this situation because one student last week told me about yes, uh, this important also to get a uh, good grades. And something that I, that I always emphasize is the, the moment is going to, to talk in the situation, but something that I know by sure is that the people that have the more training or more preparation have more possibilities to get out of um, earthquake or another uh, situation. And it's something that is important, not only try to be like a manual that drop, cover, hold, and you have to do this. Only I encourage the safety. If you are in a place and maybe your bin is not safe, your table is not safe, you have to uh, find the, the place that is more safe for you. Always think in safety. And it's something that the people really like. 
just wanted to jump in and add something that I've heard the team talk about also on this regard is um, that if you have, um, you know, especially multi levels or, or classrooms that um, have a lot of people in them, if you um, are hoping to get everyone to evacuate really fast during or um, shake when shaking starting, that is going to also cause a lot of problems. So it's a very complicated system. You can't just um, say everyone get out or you're, you're going to have some issues. Thank you so much. Anybody want to add anything? I just wanted to add just a quick thing. Um, besides telling people about, uh, about this, we tell them about falling objects because usually people are afraid of the building collapsing. But uh, we in Haiti, we, we do not take into account that placing objects uh, in, a, in a way that it's not convenient or having um, a glass or over your head, over your, 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 your bed, and having some furniture right in front of the door so that might impede you evacuate. So we insist on that, on where people should place uh, furniture in schools, in office, and how people should anchor, anchor uh, their television because they usually place them uh, in a high place. So if they decide to do so, they need to anchor them. So we, we mostly insist on falling objects because uh, usually women, women in Haiti, we, we, we try to decorate and place things uh, in different places without thinking about uh, the, the, the danger that they, they might fall and they might kill us big, right before uh, any, the house collapse. So we insist on that also. Thank you so much. So we're going to end with one last question, um, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, so the question is from Eric Calais. It's according to GHI's experience, what is the usefulness, potential impact of recent technologies, social networks, et cetera, to engage kids, youth, and the population in general on risk reduction in Haiti? Wendy, do you want to take a stab at this one? Uh, yes, thank you, Veronica, and thank you, A, uh, this question. Um, I'd like to say that uh, the social networks and uh, in general uh, has a positive impact uh, uh, the way that kids or our youth use it nowadays uh, spread messages uh, as you know young people they use Instagram a lot they use WhatsApp and uh, the, the materials that we develop such as flyers we 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 encounter advertisement but also they, they they share the messages uh through this uh, those platforms and post it on the walls uh, so that they communicate to uh their friends you know like to the population um just uh, uh, inform them uh about the risk and the behavior that they should have uh when those things happen so that is to say that we do use a social network and it has a boredom in in our program and both you wendy and garmalia um and i think even jeff they have radio shows isn't that right and you reach out to the public and and kids you want to talk about yeah that? We, yes we, we, we yeah we do have a radio shows and uh, I think uh, Gamalia can uh, add most since she has a weekly uh, radio broadcast, but also on special dates, we also have testing, uh, for example, uh, May 7, uh, February 12. Uh, so we, we invite uh, other people to join as a panelist uh, to you know, present topic on disaster risk management. Gamalia, you can add more, please. Oh, you're on mute, Garmelia. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, I just wanted to mention that, um, as most of you might know, we have lack of energy in Haiti. So uh, sometimes, uh, so most of the time, people are not very uh, uh, prone to watch TV. So uh, most of the time, people uh, and most people use or have the smartphone. So they have access to a smartphone and it's easier for them to get it uh, recharged. So most kids use uh, social networks and technologies and they know that they, they receive information in real time 
and and they can search for information. So um, this is in response to uh, to Eric Kale. So it's very very impactful now uh, to use uh, this channel for young people uh, as they are really really interested in getting information and uh, they watch for short videos that we disclose. And, and sometimes when we have activity, they like to watch it live. So um, they, they mostly use social networks uh, for now. So I think it's really important to, uh, in our project, to disclose short videos regarding each hazard. So we, we make sure that most people get it uh, and, and they can share it. What is different when using uh, TV or radio? But uh, anyway, uh, we have uh, we have a radio show. Uh, we 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 use uh, many many uh, radio station at the same time when we want to uh, to make people focus on on some specific information on special dates. Uh, so we have many radios joining uh, together or willing to partner with us to to disclose the show for mass. Uh, for the most audience. Thank you so much, Garmalia and Wendy, for those excellent uh, responses. So I'd like to close. So um, in closing, I'd like to come back to where we began. Uh, we recounted various disasters that have affected Haiti for the past 15 years or so. Heidi explained the magnitude and frequency of these events while also indicating how future earthquakes, tsunamis, and tropical storms continue to threaten the nation and neighboring Dominican Republic. You heard the personal experiences of our local team members, Jeff in the South and how he's helping his community after the recent disasters. Our team in the North who are, mo who are motivated to build disaster resilience in their country after the 2010 earthquake. We learned that Haiti faces deep, complex challenges that are plaguing the nation, but we also heard of progress and action in spite of these challenges. We heard of opportunities, authentic engagement across sectors, and of amazing people who are deeply committed to their communities. Our team has been incredibly resourceful with what they have been given, but there's still a lot to do. This is why we're still here. This is why we're continuing our work and why we're taking a long-term approach. So I hope that you walk away today with a different perspective on Haiti, one that is proactive and looks to the future, that recognizes the power of authentically engaging and supporting local leaders, and that sees the possibility of a safer, more resilient Haiti. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you again to our speakers.